It just all right. Up. Welcome everyone to VO Booth Besties. We're here to help working voice actors get your most important answers. Quest. Get your most important questions answered by industry pros who know. Each week we've, oh, we've had a new topic and a guest speaker, but this week you get us. Um, if you've missed a live episode, you can always catch the recording later on our website, boothbesties.com or anywhere you listen to podcasts. And be, be sure to join our Facebook group as well. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. I know we're on a different day, um, same time, and I know we're crossing over with some other live um, podcasts right now, but thanks for joining us if you're here. Today is a Ask Us Anything opportunity. We are celebrating our 80th episode, which is totally crazy. Wild. I know. I can't believe we've uh, we've done so much and covered so much ground, so many amazing topics, had incredible speakers, provided as much value as we could for the voiceover community, and really just freelancers in general, because a lot of it also has crossover to running a small business. But we're so glad you guys have been along for the ride and supported us to this point. Uh, today, we're also going to do a little recap, talk about some of our favorite episodes, what's been happening um, over these last 80 episodes. And for those who might be new, let's introduce ourselves. So I'll start. I'm Jen Greenfield. My nickname is NJ or Naked Jen. No, I'm never really naked, but it's part of my branding and kind of a little for fun joke. Um, that I was nicknamed. And so most people call me NJ. Uh, I live in Scottsdale, Arizona. I am a full-time voice actor, but I also do on camera and I'm also a singer and I get to add mocap to my list. Ooh, ooh, I finally got to do that uh, a month or so ago. And anyhow, I'm one of the booth besties. We host this podcast weekly. Um, and I primarily work in commercial and I'm getting into animation and um, yeah, and I've done a few audiobooks. So I kind of just pop around to different things. So if you need high energy, <laughs> charismatic, I know shocking uh, voice, that's kind of where I fall. So um, AB, how about you? Well, I am... I'm a professional voice actor. Imagine that. Weird, right? I have been doing this for about six years, and I work out of my home in Raleigh, North Carolina. I have five children, and that is kind of my primary career. Yes, five. Hundred, it feels like, some days. And um, my, my job primarily lies in commercial narration and um, corporate narration, explainers, um, I do some phone stuff, you know, like I think like everybody else, I dabble in all of the things except <clears throat> anything funny. I'm not funny. <laughs> if you've ever if you've ever watched our listened or watched our show before, you'll know I'm not funny. Um, but we I'm trying to think what else about me is interesting. I am an avid DIYer. I love to build things as does both of the other, do both of the other gens. Um, we like to do anything that gets us using power tools and feeling <laughs> strong and confident. Um, and I usually say I have chickens, but I downsized my responsibilities recently and decided to focus more on what was important and let go of the chickens. And it's hilarious because literally that same week my neighbor started her chicken started laying eggs and she has too much and she brings them over and I don't have to do anything it's great I still get eggs and I don't have to clean up poop anymore um uh let's turn it over to JT tell us a little bit about you uh let's see I started in radio I've had a studio in my house since 2007 so ahead of my time um had a handful of clients that I produce stuff for wrote the copy, did all the production, added the music and the effects and sent everything out. I was kind of a one-stop shop. Um, 2015, pretty much the same time as everybody else that um, discovered those freelance websites for the first time, uh, went full-time. Uh, the booth now is a, the game changer. I've, I've gone from the alcove attic and mailing cassettes to source connect in a booth which is really nice um i have done a lot of odd 
job kind of things in my life. Like I spent a summer as a carny traveling around to the state fairs, selling donuts out of a trailer. Wow. Yeah. Um, and you know, showing my age Wayne's world. I at one point had an extensive collection of hairnets and name tags <laughs> from all the fast food jobs. Uh, two kids, husband, dog, two cats. I'm pretty much halfway between Philly and New York. And, um, oh, we had an earthquake today. So that was exciting. 4.8. Hey, all my earthquake friends. Um, yeah, that's it. I mostly work in, um, commercial, uh, corporate narration, medical, technical. They're my, they're my big three things. Awesome. Well, today we're going to go through a couple of different things. We're going to talk about what are some of our favorite episodes. We're going to talk about what are the things that we love most about our careers. We're going to talk about um, what are some of the questions that we get asked the most frequently because all of us have found that um, our inboxes are constantly full of questions. And um, we we really just want to open up the space for you guys to ask questions. If you're in, if you're watching live, feel free. And if not, we'll use the questions that we've gotten over the year. So uh, let's start with you, NJ. Can you tell us what are some of the biggest challenges that you face in your career and how you overcome them? That's a great question. I'm in the unique position. This is something I, I was actually just thinking about it this morning before you even asked me that. Um, I've been in the business the least, a uh, voiceover specifically, not in the entertainment industry, as far as entertainment, acting, you know, performing that's been since I was seven years old, I got cast in my first opera. So uh, that's always been a part of my life, but being in voiceover industry specifically, I'm the newest of our trio. And what I found interesting is, gosh, even in the last year, the, you know, the online casting and, and, and finding the work where some people have had success in the past, probably five years, 10 years ago, five years ago, but in the last three years that, yeah, everything's become inundated, you know, with, with lots of different talent is retaining customers. Um, I'm sure we see this with, um, you know, just even working in the corporate world there is no longer this, and this is a blanket statement, general statement, there's not loyalty, right? If I can get the better deal, I can get the better rate, I can get the higher um, salary. If I've been with a company for two years, I'll leave. There, there's, And so what I've been finding is what made, what I was thinking of this morning was when I was on an e, I was on an e-learning panel um, at One Voice last year. And it was so interesting and it's not something that I thought of at the time. And I wish I had, I was sitting on a panel with people who have been in the industry 10 years, more than 10 years. And they were talking about how important non-broadcast work is to their career and that it's like 75% of their income, you know, that they're not necessarily getting all the big national campaigns for commercials and things like that, that the bulk of it is in non-broadcast. And we would talk about where, you know, what is non-broadcast and where are opportunities. You two both do a lot more corporate work than I do. Um, and so, but what came to me was you don't just automatically do a job and then that client becomes a repeat client. I, I'm coming full circle here. And it's longevity. Like you are, you get those repeat clients way over time. It's not like they've got another project next month and they're just automatically going to come back to you. And oftentimes, again, back to my loyalty comment, they'll just repost their next job and do somebody, there's not that necessarily that loyalty. And so the importance of the relationship, but those repeat clients, I think that's something that I'm only just now starting to get. I promise I'm trying to stay on track here. So for folks who are like, you know, oh, my business is just all this corporate area, you know, and all this repeat, 
I think it's a little misleading because oftentimes the repeat work may not happen for a year or two years later or, you know, later on down the line. And so cultivating those clients and those repeat clients, that's been something because I'm, I'm just newer than you guys. So I have to m remind myself to give it a minute. Um, and that just now coming into this year, into 2024, I'm starting to get the, Hey, we worked on something last year. Oh, awesome. You know, and then starting to do that. And so that's one of the obstacles I think, and it's, that's more of a mental obstacle to go, wait, I'm not supposed to just get a job and automatically think they're going to hire me again for the very next job or for, or next month, or, you know, in this short period of time. Um, so but one of the things I feel that I am good at is that connecting, that networking, that relationship building. And so if I get in my head like, God, why did, you know, should I be bothering them? Should I be emailing them going, hey, do you have another project? No, like that to, to trust that the relationship is there, to trust that I did a good job and they liked what I did and to trust that, yeah, when the next thing comes around, you know, uh, you know, that they, they will think of me, you know, but to not be crushed if I'm not the very next voice for their very next job, which they may need somebody different or a male jump in JT. So one of the things we talked about last week with Kay, um, when we were talking about your approach, when you email an agent is do a little research and consider their age, the clients that I've had the longest, um, Microsoft, uh, we've been together for seven years now. Um, NetJets, ha that's been six. It's the difference in the person you're working with, I think. Um, younger people who are doing these jobs just don't have that loyalty mentality that people my age too. So my repeat clients that are consistent for years now are my age. And we, we just have that. Why try and change it? If it's working, they know I'm going to be right there. They know they're getting it in a couple of hours or overnight. And they appreciate that where younger buyers, I think just, they move on and it's, it's easier for them. Cause I've even noticed with some of the, um, some of the medical stuff I've been doing in the last maybe two years, the buyers are younger. And so I'm still getting those jobs on voice one, two, three from the same people, but they're still posting every time. And I audition every time exactly. Exactly. and they're still hiring me, but it could have saved them a whole lot of time if they would have just emailed me and said, Hey, are you available? You you're, you're hitting my, the nail on the head. But I think this again goes back to, I'm newer in the industry, so mm. I'm already recognizing that. And so yeah. I think a lot of frustration for more veteran actors who've been in for, you know, 10, you know, over five years are like, I don't get it. And what's happening? And what? And I think it's, we are just seeing that we have literally, how many times have we said, we got to pivot, we got to pivot, yep. new strategy, new strategy. And you're right. The clients are changing the speed in which they need to create content and what that looks like and is UGC um, user generated content doing better for them than paying voiceover and you know and producing a video versus more of this kind of um well AB you're so active on TikTok like what 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 do you call it where you know it's it's almost like reality real time you know live um, like <laughs> interview style yeah it's a different world I think and we're just learning ex we're learning so much that we have to be constantly adapting to the way that the market is shifting and changing. And um, one thing we've been talking a lot about is that there, there's maybe a shift from agents getting the bulk of the work to the work coming through other streams. And we have to find those streams and figure out how to tap into that. I've just noticed, and I think you guys are all in that, there's a production company that we're we're all getting uh, auditions from. And when I started getting auditions from them a year ago, it was very sporadic and there were very few of them and they were never commercial work. It was always corporate work. And as time has gone on, they're getting more commercial work. They're getting bigger corporate jobs. They're getting, and I'm seeing more and more of those auditions coming in. And I think that's representative of that shift. So, um, 
JT, are there any specific challenges that you feel like that you face in your career other than what we're discussing? Um, for me, uh, getting representation. I have two regional agents and I am not having any success in getting a national agent. And I think part of it is my age and my voice print, and they've already got people on the roster that sound a lot like me. But another part of it, I think, is that they're so inundated every day with talent looking for representation that I like my emails just not even getting open. Yeah. Yeah. You, so we've reached a point where you really have to know somebody and, mm -hmm. and we always talk about knowing somebody and getting jobs, but really now you do have to have a recommendation of some sort and it's got to go through their email, not your email saying so-and-so recommends me, but they need to send the email. Right. And that's, that's a big shift that's made getting an agent much harder now than it was even just three years ago or two years ago. Yeah. And even in the last year, uh, again, with the shift that you just talked about with um, a lot of the work going directly to a production house and cutting out that middleman of the agent, we've seen so many agencies either close or be absorbed. And, and the ones that have closed, those people who were represented are being picked up by the other national agents who, God bless them, like they're trying to make sure that nobody gets left in the dust. If that was their main source of um, auditions, that, you know, it's, it's very kind of them to, to take these people and put them on their rosters. But that means that any of those spots that were open on their roster are being filled by these other people who are being absorbed. But we we talked to two major agents um, while we were in Atlanta, and I can tell you that that I think that's temporary. I think they're trying to do a nice thing, but these Ross mm -hmm. they're trying to find reasons to cut people. So just because you know, like they are like, if you're not booking work in six months, twelve months, eighteen months, like they're they're going to start downsizing the rosters. I mean, we were told that unequivocally that, you know, and, and we all know this firsthand and, and, and Suzanne Spaziani even talked about it when she, um, has, has met with, um, all the besties is that, and Tim Walsh with Atlas brought this up. He said, it is such a disservice to the talent to have these bloated rosters to have so, because he said, they both said casting, they want three. Five. I mean, think about it. If you have a roster of 50, 100, you know, talent, but yet you're supposed to only pit, you know, submit three, maybe five auditions from your agency. I mean, that, that is hard. And then if you're not real active, you, you may never, even if you have an agent, great. But if you're not getting submitted because their roster is so overloaded, then again, we're back to pivot new strategy. Like again, we put so much emphasis on an agent and yes, an agent does get access to jobs that we may not, but again, who's your audience? Who are these production companies? Like how, how do we navigate this fast turnover, quick content creation kind of, um, you know, mentality right now? Yeah. So Anyway, so just so so just don't lose heart, I would say generally that, but I also think, and AB's commented on this, now is also probably not a good time to be pushing for representation either, because they're trying to fix up, you know, try to kind of figure out where everybody's gonna go, what to do with agents, what to do with the talent. Um, and so you really, really will get lost in the shuffle. Go ahead, right. AB. Yeah. And like I posted on TikTok last week and I said, don't submit to agents right now. And I think some of the people listening misunderstood and they're saying, well, that's not it. You're saying we shouldn't because we should care about these other people. And it's it's so sad that they've lost their agency representation. And yes, to some degree, yes, let's make sure that people who have worked hard and paid their dues get heard. Right. But that doesn't mean that they're any better than you. And it doesn't mean that they deserve to be listened to any more than you. The thing is, you're going to get lost. 
And so it's just, if you're, someone told me, I'm submitting and submitting and submitting, and I'm not hearing back from anything, so I must not be good enough. And it's like, no, 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 you're probably not even getting heard. Like, we're talking hours of listening to demos a day sometimes, and they're they're inundated. So now is not the best time to submit for sure. But that doesn't mean that in a couple of weeks or in a month that you shouldn't submit. Just give it some time. Let the dust settle a little bit. Um, I will say that one of my biggest challenges that I feel like I face is I feel this constant pull to do more, to be better, to 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 achieve higher. And yet my life pulls me back you know, and I I don't have the time to invest that other people do in their careers. I don't have the flexibility um, in my schedule that others might have because I've got to drive kids to school or I've got to go do this or, and and I that's what I choose and I I choose my family and so I constantly have to remind myself it's okay that you're not growing at the same rate as person X Y or Z because this is your choice and. One of the things that is so has become so vital for me to overcoming that constant tug, like, oh, I could be doing so much more. I could be I could be growing more. I could be marketing more. I could be doing more is to remind myself and anybody who took my class at, at View Atlanta will know because I said this extensively, but we cannot measure our success by other people's measuring sticks. And when we consistently do that and we we get in and and we say, oh, but you know, and Jen Greenfield just booked this really cool job and I didn't. So uh, I'm not as good. It's well, Jen Greenfield's success stick is about this and mine is measured this way. They're not they, they're not measured the same. So it's helped me to constantly rem remind myself of that. I measure success very differently than you do or than, you know, um, Bob Daniel, who's listening or Terry Briscoe. Hey, guys. You guys, we actually have some questions in the chat. Did anybody want to Listen, comment about that before we move to those? No, I just think you're so on point. And I think that's the other part of also just being active on social media. And I'm sure <laughs> we all know this is for all the booked it um, posts and things like that. You know, it can get very discouraging and you can and people who are signing with agents. But, you know, I did talk to uh, one very good colleague um, who said, why would you post booked it when it's literally your job to book it? <laughs> I did think that was kind of funny. I mean, we do like the validation. We like to have our, you know, bragging rights for a minute, but it, it was kind of funny. It was like, you should be saying that should be a post then like every other day or every week, you know, if that's, you know, what we're, again, your measuring stick, but to remember <sighs> life happens, um, things get in the way, you know, the construction that's happening next door, like that is not about you your skill. That is not right. about your acting ability. Um, you're just, you're on point with that. Someone in your house gets sick and you're the caretaker or whatever, you know, you just, or you are, get sick and or you, you can't get work, sick. you know? Yes. I, yes. So yeah. I think you, you make a really great point. Um, but a lot of this is the mental game. I think we're, we've already accidentally hit, you know, me going, Hey, how do I retain more customers? And then remembering that, Oh wait, these people have had, have been working for 10 years. So of course they have repeat customers, Meh, but that's a mental thing. Feeling like maybe you don't have a place, you know, right now, or that there's too many voices that sound just like you. That's a mental game. You saying, you know, you're, it's like, so I think we're really keying in on something here is perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the things that I actually, a question that I get asked a lot that I put down in our questions that we can talk about right now is how do we keep from comparing ourselves to others, not just in our career, but in our voices? I actually caught myself today, today, this morning, someone posted that they had booked about a job that they had done and it was someone I know and it was a company I work with and I was pretty sure it was an audition I had done. And I literally thought to myself, I should go listen to her website and samples to see what she sounds like because that's clearly what they want. No, that's not. That's not how it works, you guys. That's not. Don't get caught in that trap of thinking that you've got to sound like them. Go listen to them and figure out what they sound like to know what's booking because that's not That's not um, necessarily. Now, if you go and you listen to a bunch of different voice actors to listen for trends and the way that the flow is and what that conversational tone sounds like. What do the finished products sound like on jobs that you've auditioned for? Go look them up on iSpot TV, figure out what they went with. And I love 
finding out that they went with like a Hispanic male because then I go, A, cool, inclusion, right? We're making sure everybody's represented when when you listen to the to the TV. But also, I didn't compete with that. There was no, yeah. it wasn't, I wasn't good enough. I just wasn't that person, you know, so. And how many times have we said that what you're hearing on TV or radio as the final product had no, no similarity to the audition. So what they're, what the final product is probably sounds completely different than how they audition. And there was just something in that audition that you can't replicate because it's not you that caught their attention. And they were like, oh, that's who I want. I mean, Hilton, I did, I've done stuff now the last two years for Hilton for their in, you know, like when you're in the room and you're watching their channel for their credit card. And my audition sounded nothing like the way they direct me. It was very down to earth and very casual. And hey, here's this Hilton Honors credit card and you get these points and perks. What's playing in that room is the Hilton Honors Plus credit card. Like, it's completely different. So yeah. You- and I highly recommend everybody go listen to um, Atlanta voiceover studio posted a week ago. They have a YouTube channel and they posted this video. It is literally five minutes. They have these like shorts and it is um, dang it. I just forgot, but it's Heidi Ru- stout, Mike stout. That's Heidi Ru's mm-hmm. husband, right? <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Mike. Um he posted a a little snippet about how they've talked to agents and casting directors and they're saying, we, we're hearing auditions that sound like they are ready to go to production and throwing them out because it they want to hear authenticity. They want to hear groundedness. They want to hear mistakes. They want to hear g- breaths. They want to hear mouth Human. clicks. Yeah. And when, and they, they're not listening for ready to go audio. And they said, it's actually holding you back. And I'm not doing a great job of recapping it. Go listen to them. Um, it's Atlanta voiceover studio. Just search for them on YouTube and you'll find their, uh, their shorts, but it, it's a great point that we have to just try to be more real. So, um, let's get to a couple of the questions in the comments. Um, Terry asked, Will they be downsizing those who get shortlisted as well? And I believe he's referring to agents as they're having to call their rosters. I don't think so. That's my opinion is no. If you're if you're being shortlisted and you're not always going to know that, I, you know, I reached out to my agent when I'd been with them for about six months and I was like, am I doing anything right? I'm not booking anything. And I was kind of frustrated. And they were like, oh, you're getting shortlisted all the time. And I was like, I didn't know. I had no idea. So it brings up a good point. It's okay to reach out to your agent and ask. I think a lot of what I, I'm i hearing, and I think you've heard the same thing. Um, the people who are, are getting cut are the ones who are not responding to auditions, who aren't booking anything, who aren't being shortlisted. It's a relationship. Yeah. You know, yes, your agent works for you, but you need, like, it's a two-way street. You know, I've heard people say, ah, I've got a ton of agents. Well, if you're not actually, it it doesn't matter if you're on the roster, if you're not participating in the process. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. So um, So, Bob Daniel asked, this is a totally different topic, but he says, given April 15th is right around the corner, it seems there are innumerable services we need, CRM, website hosting, accounting, et cetera. He says, Leaving out coaching, pay-to-play subscriptions, and conferences, what's a reasonable range for recurring monthly expenses? And uh, Bob, you're asking me to do math. <laughs> I don't do math. JT, you know all your data. Do you know how much you spend every month? Um, it varies, but there are expenses that are expected. Um, audition. Yep. I it's like twenty two fifty a month for audition, uh, fifteen dollars a month for Canva, fifteen dollars a month for Dropbox, um, and there are some variables. Uh, my accountant does a percentage of certain parts of my electric and my phone and uh, internet and just those household things. Part of my mortgage based on the square footage. So it, there isn't really a set 
range that's acceptable. It's going to depend a lot on your personal home expenses. Um, but I think he's getting at like what what we're spending monthly. You know, like audition. That's yeah. So I mean, audition okay. so you Zoom. Can do... If you have that, you know. Right. So theoretically, yeah. Okay. Very good. So for your business, uh, like I know my LLC here in Arizona is five hundred bucks. Like I pay the attorney. She did the whole thing. Everything gets filed. I get an EIN. Okay, done. There's no additional monthly fee for that. So I'm right. a business. I mean, you could spend money on a CRM. You could also have an Excel spreadsheet and that's your CRM. Um, yeah. That is free with your software on your computer. Um, yes. So if you are someone who is creating graphics and digital content, I highly recommend, JT already mentioned it, Canva. That is, I think, $99 a year, but you can break it out uh, um, each month. There is, um, um, what? oh, so like your website. So I think- 250 a year. Yeah, I think that's about what I spend. But we're with Wix. Um, so, okay. And then there is an additional fee for when you um your domain. Your domain and, and when the you custom make, email. Your custom I, email. So I pay extra for that. Yes. And and when I say extra, I feel like it's twelve dollars or something yeah. a year, you know. So it's less so, than three hundred a year all told, I think. All which in. you could yeah. break up to buy month and figure out what it was. Um, but yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, when you're talking about um, whether you're using Twisted Wave, Audition, you know, we know Audacity, you know, we know Audacity is free. So, I mean, you know, so if it's really kind of, if we're talking, trying to pare down, there's options. But otherwise, I mean, yeah, I think, again, this goes back to the the upfront costs, trying to get into voiceover. And, and we're going to talk about this later. Like when we talked to Danny States, like when we've talked to Paul Schmidt, getting yourself established rather than kind of guessing or just kind of fake it till you make it, which we hear that expression a lot, taking a minute, give yourself three months, six months, save the money, um, get yourself an LLC, get your website built, like go ahead and take a minute because the minute you rush in and you're trying to maybe you book the big job, but you're like, oh my gosh, I have no payment method set up. I, I don't know how to do the thing, you know, and all of a sudden you're scrambling. I think there is value in give yourself a minute and build your business first, do it right. And it also is a level, because again, I don't say that everybody needs to make voiceover their, their, that it has to be a full-time that it has to become, I don't even think career is the right word, but where it's your main source of income. I don't think you have to get to that place. I think you can do voiceover as a hobby. However, it's still a business. I mean, it still needs to yeah. be treated that way because the thing could happen. We've all known people who happen to book the big gig, but even when you're doing it as a side gig, it's still a business and you still want to look professional. So having these things in place it's just going to help you in the long run. So don't be me. I, I auditioned for my first voiceover thing, which was an audio book. I auditioned in my closet. I hold my phone up with my iPhone like this. Right. And I booked the very first thing I auditioned for, which is not normal, but it was a royalty share, to be clear. <laughs> and um, I didn't own a microphone. I had no idea what room treatment was. I remember standing at Walmart in front of the egg crate mattresses thinking, maybe I should Google this before I buy this stuff and staple it to my walls. And then realizing that that's not what people put on their walls. Um, so yeah, we need to learn about the business. All right, let's move on. Wait, to... wait, wait. I have one oh, thing want... to say about oh. that. I think what you're spending monthly should be commensurate with what you're making monthly. If you're not booking, like it should only be a percentage. If you're booking... $2,000 a month. I think the percentage is like 10%. So your expenses shouldn't exceed 10% 10 of, of what you're making. So I think that may be once you're, I think once you're answers. established is yeah. important because I know the first year, at least the first year, maybe the first two years I spent, I reinvested like 80% of what I made oh, back absolutely. into my business. And I had the luxury of doing that because 
we had been living on one income for 15 years. So it wasn't more than 15 years. So it, it was comfortable to do that. Um, so I just kept reinvesting it. And I think the more that you reinvest back in up to a certain point, you know, like don't, if you've been doing this for three years and you've never made any money because you're just spinning your wheels and getting stuck in what I call the spend cycle, and you're just spinning and spinning and spinning, it's time to jump off the spend cycle and start working, right? You There is a point where you've done, you've done the, you've done the work, get out and do the work. And I think remembering too that, you know, we've we've seen it time and again. And I know Paul Schmidt just made a video about it, and I haven't I haven't gone and watched it yet. But that jumping in with two feet, possibly unprepared, or probably not even sometimes you just don't know what you don't know insurance, setting aside money, you know, just be, yep. because again, in the end guys, when you're a non-union voice actor, you are a freelance, you are a freelancer, you are contract work. The minute the job is finished, you're fired, which means you have to find the next job to get hired for. And as soon as you do that 30 second spot, you're fired again. And, and taking that mentality is so important because you're not getting a four, you're not getting to contribute in a 401k as a freelancer, you have to do that. You're not, you may not have insurance. You have to do that. Um, you know, there's, so this isn't necessarily a part of be of, of voice acting specifically, but remembering you are a small business and you are a freelancer and there are other aspects. Again, sometimes you're like, I don't even know to know that. And that's part of being a professional and building a business is you need to learn those other factors to take into consideration. Absolutely. Rochelle Real, I think I think we call her Shelly. I'm trying Shelley. to remember. Shelly. Um, she said, have a plan in place. And that's it. Like, do you have a business plan? You can go online and Google business plan and, and you know, put it all together. Don't do it. Don't do it backwards and sit in your closet and think you can book work and then do it and have no idea what EQ is, you know, or have no idea what it, what it means to edit audio. Like, you've got to know the stuff. Um, let's see. What's some of our other questions are um so terry said so is it better when you hear a sound that wins the job that isn't remotely like yours or one that sounds exactly like yours but you didn't book it and it's you have no idea what their audition sounded like right. so just because the final product sounded like your final product that you sent as your audition doesn't mean that that's what their audition sounded like something about their audition may just have grabbed them you guys have any other thoughts on that? I um, think it's just a mood, just like, you know, making it onto a roster. Yep. You, if you hit them at the right time and you, you know, it just, it so depends. It's subjective. I don't think there's any, yep. yeah, completely subjective. I don't think there's any rhyme or reason to it. I, uh, I was in a play in my early years, um, I, I, my twenties and I, it was Brigadoon and walking into the, to the show, uh, to the audition, there was this nice older gentleman in the parking lot, and I talked to him and said hi, and we chatted as we were going in. And um, I got the one of the lead roles in the play, and it was because he was the producer and he got to choose. And I didn't know that. I didn't. I wasn't being nice to him because of I thought he was going to pick me. I thought he was auditioning. Um, so you just never know who you're talking to. You never know how it's going to affect things. I would say that's a good lesson to always be positive, always be nice. Don't go online and gripe about the people you've worked with, you know, or be negative about the industry as much as possible. I mean, you know, sometimes we're just going to need to vent, but um, next question. I'm new to having an agent. When is a good time to check in with them? What are your thoughts on that, NJ? Um, I mean, I, not, not now. I mean, like newing to have, I mean, like I would kind of like what you went through AB is, you know, probably give yourself, I would say three to six months. I mean, because you got to get the auditions, you got to mm -hmm. start submitting. Um, if you are not booking anything, okay. Like make a mental note, but like AB said, you could be getting shortlisted, you know, yeah. but agents also are dealing with a lot of talent. So you do need to be mindful and find that balance between, Hey, I just wanted to, you know, reach out, 
you know, is everything coming across okay? And then, and if you get a yes, because oftentimes, what's the expression? No news is good news. Like, yeah. Sometimes if you don't hear anything, you're good. Like, let's don't don't make it a big thing. Um, but agents are busy and they're trying to to manage a lot of different talent and trying to get clients and trying to you know work with casting and um, negotiating deals, finding you know getting payment for their talent who book. Uh, so I wouldn't get too caught up in it just yet. And yeah. like I said too, uh, both these ladies can can speak to this as well. A lot of times, and again, the, I'm getting this directly from from agents I've talked to. Just because you get signed, please remember you may not be you. You have to give yourself and the agent time for you to work up to. Now you could come in and just gangbusters, and that's great. But the way it often works is it's so competitive and it, and you, you just need to be so on point because they get so few options to send to casting. It may take a little while. It may take three months for you to f- move your way through the roster. If that makes sense. Um, unless you have like you a super find duper, your lane. Yeah. And yeah. if you have a super duper unique sound again, different because you're, there's something else that'll be there. But a lot of times yeah, they're not just going to be like, oh, I brought you onto my roster and now you're going to be my number one person that I submit for. Mm, that's not how, that's not how it's going to work, you know? So, so yeah. you have to, you're right. Kind of find your way, find your lane. And if the agents are doing their job too, they are going to be mindful of what your voice is a fit for. We've seen where some agents are just like, Bleh, and they're sending you, you know, boy. will call. Yeah, they're yeah. doing cattle call and they're sending you stuff. You're like, I don't even call. This isn't even me at all. So that's the other thing is if they're sending you, if they're being mindful and sending you um, auditions that fit you, that suit you, that they feel confident you could book for, good. Then you're, you know, you are working out that relationship and there's good communication there. Um, but I wouldn't jump on it too fast. You're gonna have to give yourself a minute and understand too that just because you sign, just because you get joined to a roster. They've been working with some talent and they're booking, you know, they're going to be still kind of their upper echelon. Doesn't mean you're not the same skill level, but it's just, again, it's relationship building guys. And then, you know, so. I think a good way to approach it too. And, and she's, you know, she said um, she's new to having an agent, but we don't know how long that is. New could be a year. It could be six months. It could be two weeks. Right. And she could be established as a voice actor and only just now got, so that's fair. That's a fair point. So if you, if you've been with your agent, I would say three months is a, is a good window to, to check in and just say, Hey, I would love feedback on how you think I'm doing. Am I adding value? Another way to approach it is to send them an email and ask, Hey, I'd love your suggestions for who you think I should coach with. Are there is there anyone you recommend? That's actually what I did that got the response back. Stop coaching. You're fine. We like you the way that you are. Don't don't go changing your sound. We like your sound. Um and that was that was really great feedback for me at the time because I was in a place where I was like, I don't know, am I doing good? Like I'm feeling a little imposter syndrome. So, um Terry says, people re- don't realize how competitive it really is at agencies. I once got an email with all the people that they sent the audition to by mistake, and it was easily over 300 people. Um, yeah, I think that definitely depends on the agency, but some of them do have really large rosters. I know um, when we were in Atlanta, uh, who'd they have on the stage? Lollapita, Suzanne, Atlas, and DPN. Was it DPN or DDO? And Jay, she disappeared. I don't remember who the other one was, but Law said she had 500 people on her roster. That's that's gigantic. Um, I think that Atlas said they keep about 50. So it just depends on your agency. I don't actually know how many my agency keeps. Um, so yeah, it's a lot either way. And um, I think it's about, just about cultivating that relationship too and knowing, knowing that you have a trust established. If your agent is only sending you stuff that's a good fit for you and suddenly you get an audition, you're like, I don't know if I can do this. Don't second guess yourself. Tell yourself, my agent believes in me. My agent believes I can do this. Um, Because I, this was something that I experienced uh, last year where I got an audition and it said improv. Um, We want you to be funny. I'm not funny. (laughs) And I literally closed it and walked in my house. 
And then I went, eh, what the heck? I might as well just try it. And I booked it eventually. It's kind of a story to that one. But I did. And I thought, well, my agent believes I can be funny. I guess I could try, you know, and I did. So not only that, but I think sometimes they're aware that the client isn't really sure what they're looking for. Um, I remember uh, Bridget Real talking to us in um, our interview with her and her saying that, you know, one of her agents sent her an audition for, you know, it said male and had these specs and she contacted the agent and said, why did you send me this? And he said, well, I know what it says, but I think if they hear you, they might really like you for this because he had worked with this client before and he was aware that, you know, they don't necessarily know what they want. Mm -hmm. She booked it. So yeah. I think that's the other part of that. If they send you something that they normally wouldn't, it's because they know something about the client that you don't. So um, I want to, I don't, we don't have any more questions that I can see. If I missed something, y'all put it back out. But um, one thing I wanted to discuss really quick before we close up is how, um, where do you think your breaking point was in your voiceover career? Where you went from, <clears throat> and yours may be very different, JT, because you came from radio, but was there a time when you were like, okay, I've made it. I'm I'm doing this. This is my job. Where and maybe that's where you stopped saying, "I want to be a voice actor," and started telling people that you are a voice actor. You know, um, I think the shift for me, and again, yeah, it's going to be different for me because I've been in this for so long, um, approaching seventeen years now, eighteen, eighteen almost. Um, I would say. The shift for me happened when the the pay to plays really took off in 2015, because up to that point, I was kind of in the middle of Pennsylvania, not near um, New York, not clearly not near L.A. And a lot of those opportunities, especially for commercial promo, um, you had to have an agent and those auditions were in the studio and I wasn't near a studio. So I didn't have an opportunity to audition for things the way that I did once the pay to plays opened up the casting sites. Um, that first year, my income went from, I think with my own little clients that I'd been working with for seven, eight years. Um, if I had a $12,000 year, I was like, what? this yeah. is awesome. And I busted my butt. Those were like a hundred dollars a pop. And I did all the work. I wrote the, I did all the work. And then the the pay to place came along and I was, I was booking. And I think part of the difference there for me was that I had the in-home studio already. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the pool was a lot smaller. And that first year in 2015, I made like a good full-time salary compared to the market that I live in. Yeah. Like, you know, somebody with a nine to five office job, I was making a high end full-time salary comparable to that. Um, and it's just, it's been consistent since. Yeah. I think that's where, um, where we have to recognize that when the industry changes, things about our career change, right? Because for me, I came in after pay to plays were already established, uh, but right before COVID. So my career, I, I have kind of two breaking points, <clears throat> excuse me, and one's a positive one and one is not. Um, so the first one is when I finally got professional coaching because I started this and it was DIY. I, I DIY everything. I don't pay people to do stuff for me. I don't pay coaches. I, I figure it out on my own. I was clawing my way through, right? So for nine months, I was working on um, an online site that is... Uh, voice bunny bunny studios and i'm not shy about that my agents know i started there it's not i no shame um i didn't know any better right and i was working 40 to 60 hours a week and making about two thousand dollars a month so and which was i never made any money i mean i'd made money but not like that you know and so finally to have some source of income felt great but i was killing myself for it and i decided it was time to make a demo and so i 
called up to make a demo and they were like, well, you need to do coaching first. Um, you know, and I had one session and cause I was already booking, I, you know, I had clawed my way through nine months of working and I took that one hour coaching session and she taught me everything I had spent nine months learning. And I want you to know that it hit me really strongly that I could have been booking so much more work and doing better jobs and making more money if I had done that coaching nine months earlier. If I had taken the, you know, the humility check, excuse me, <clears throat> I am not one of those people who was like, I'm not good enough. Nope. I was like, I'm great. I got this. And then I realized, oh, wait, maybe I'm not as great as I thought. And if you go back, I, someday we should play our audio from when we first started, right? I know you'd have to like pull out physical CDs, but I'm just kidding. <laughs> You've got them right there. She's got them. It's um, true. Yep. But uh, on cassette, I have stuff on cassette. But I will say that once I did that coaching, that my, and it was one hour, and then I did a couple more sessions because I realized how much it helped, my career took off after that. And I went from making about, I don't know, I guess twenty four thousand dollars that year because I made about two thousand dollars a month um, to making a full time income um, in one year, and that was just the coaching that made the difference. But then COVID hit, mm -hmm. and when COVID hit, my career took off really great for the first year, right? Because everybody was recording stuff, so that year was big. Twenty, I think anybody who was already established and had a home studio in twenty twenty saw a big jump. Best then, year ever. Yep, it was a great year, and then twenty twenty one rolled around. And everybody and their mother was getting into voiceover. <laughs> and you're like, wait, the pool, just, you know, I went from seeing pay to plays have 20 to 30 auditions for every job to having 150 auditions for every job. And I was like, and I think that the demand went back down, but the supply went up. And as supply and demand shifted, so did my career. And I've managed to stay solvent and and things have happened, but it's just, you can have these ups and then you have these downs and you cannot always plan for that. And recognizing that voiceover is a career that is not going to be a stable source of income continually is super important. I had some big clients like for two or three years that brought me steady income that went away because like NJ was talking about earlier in the episode, there's not a lot of loyalty anymore in the creative field. It's not, oh, this is our voice and this is who we use consistently because these guys leave their jobs after a year or two years. They, they're, they're job hopping like crazy sauce. So you're working with somebody, you have an established relationship, they go to a new company, they don't take you with them most of the time. Right, you know? I mean, uh, rarely, but. But when they leave, the new person comes in and they're like, oh, we need to establish ourselves with new talent. Yes. And you lose those, you lose those gigs and not because you weren't great, but because there's that, that loyalty just isn't there anymore. And, you know, like you're saying, some of my, my oldest clients that I've had more than five years are older. They've been there. They've stayed with their career the whole time, you know? Right. And that's what makes the difference. So do you want to, let's wrap it up. We're at 157. Okay. Maybe tell your favorite episode. Oh my gosh. Um, and I it's okay if NG there's more might, than one. <laughs> I think NG might even agree as hard as it was leading up to it. I think the episode that we reviewed the two takes with Liz yeah. was my favorite. It was so eye opening to sit in the seat of a casting director and hear what they hear. I mean, we took it to another level because we listened to both takes for 256 auditions, like full through. And that that's not normally how casting goes. Mm -hmm. But just to hear um hear the range of quality and um the perception of two takes and it was just amazing. Amazing. And that, I for learned anybody so much. For anybody who hasn't listened to that episode, it's season one, episode 12, the audition submission challenge with Liz Atherton. And it was a doozy of an episode, but it I really do think there was a lot of valuable information in that episode. Um, that any others that come to your mind? Uh, Deb Sperling. I loved our interview with Deb. Um, That's one of my favorites, too. 
she's just so real. And yeah. She had people crying in the audience that day. I mean, it was just so, so real and so connected. I love that episode. Let's see. That is season one, episode three. She was one of our very first episodes, and it's why authenticity matters. And I really feel like if you haven't listened to this episode or you haven't worked with Deb Sperling, this is a great place to start. Listen to the episode. You're going to want to work with her after the episode. Um, she's great at getting you down and stripping away all of the formulas and the coloring the words and all the things that I'm not saying they're not important. I think they are important to pull into our toolbox, but being able to just pull it down to what I call my nothing read. It's I'm not putting anything on. It's just me talking. Deb's just really great at getting you there. I think oh. one of my favorite episodes is um, Roger Becker. And I'm searching the website right now so I can tell you guys. Season one, episode 24. Roger Becker is the managing partner at Access Talent. And that episode is just full of gems or golden nuggets. We can say that because <laughs> NJ's not in here, but it is just full of gems of information. There's one thing he said that stuck with me and it's that auditioning is the art and the bookings are the science. So you, you're you free to create with the audition, have fun with it, relax into it, create versus the with the booking there's a science to it. They know what they want. You get in there and it's blah, 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 blah. And that's why those often sound very forced. And you look, go back and you listen to those commercials and you're like, what the heck? That is not that does not sound like what my audition sounded like at all. Bar none. Right. Um, um, some of the panel episodes have been amazing. Uh, our talk with the Latin panel and um, the yeah, just Again, yes, I open because it's it's part of the industry that I'm not part of. So that was very cool. And I I had fun when we had Tim Powers on. That was whether he was episode. our guestie or he was the guest. He's just so much fun to work with. Yeah. The the season two, episode 20 is the Latam panel. And then season two, episode 18 was the Black Voices and VO panel. And Terry Briscoe is in listening right now, or he was. Um and oh, and Jen, Jen's popped on another amazing episode. Oh, yeah, we got nominated for an award with Deb's episode, you guys. Yeah. Um, which was great. So yeah, the Black Voices panel, that was that was just brilliant. You they're really great. I I also really loved the um episode with Alexa Magnato, who is a, a casting director in New York. Um, and that is season three, episode six insights of a casting director that one was really great as well and when we had Almeida Bainan uh from oh, yeah. Harper uh that's season two episode 13 she was just such a great source of information for audiobook so if that's something that you are thinking about getting into and you'd like to know how it works from the publisher's end of things mm -hmm. definitely season two episode 13 and I'll close up with season three, episode 17 was the producers at Sora Studio, which is a production company, and they don't, they're not voice actors. And it was really nice to hear a totally different part of the industry, how they got started, how they run their business. And I think it can kind of give you a little bit of uh, insight into the people you're marketing to, like, what is their life like? What are their challenges? What are the things that they deal with? And that helps us to connect better with them. Um, and it's, it just helps us to understand who we're working with, which I think is really great. Do you have a last one you want to close up with? No, I think that's, I mean, uh, there's so many take takeaways from everything that we've done in the last year and a half. I mean, you know, 79 previous episodes, there's, there are golden nuggets in all of them. And then the, the producers that we just all interviewed, it, that was a really fun series to do too. So, yeah. um, yeah, our yeah, demo producer panel, if uh, not panel, but uh, series is available on YouTube. If you're just catching this later on after the fact, you can go and virtually interview demo producers by listening to us interview them. So, and hey, if you count those, we've done 110 episodes. Yep. If you have <laughs> questions about voiceover, there's probably a, an episode of VO Booth Besties that covers your question. More than probably. Right. So 
we want to thank all of you for being part of our audience, for being our friends and engaging with us. And I I want to announce right now that today is our last live regular recording of the podcast. For In now. the future for now. Yes. In the future, we're only going to post new episodes when we have pop-ups or we feel like there's something that really adds value that we want to bring to you because we have kind of covered all the things up until this point and we want to continue to strengthen our community and add value. We're not going away. Join our Facebook group if you're not part of our Facebook group. And um, we're going to continue to offer those pop-ups, which should be really fun. We have some good things in mind coming up. Um, but we want to just support the plethora of other really great podcasts out there rather than continuing to um, create content just for the sake of creating content. So meanwhile, what did we say we were going to call those? Oh, uh, I don't remember. Was it Bob? No, no. Dang it. MJ, do you remember? She's in the, she's in the comments, but I don't remember what it was really cute. What did we say we were going to call those? I don't know. Not pop up, but I don't know. We'll come up with it and you guys will know. It'll be great. We'll post it. <laughs> we love you all. Um, please continue to connect with each of us on LinkedIn um, and tag us. If you want us to engage with your content, tag us. We will. We'd love it. And yep. um, if you're not, again, if you're not in the VO Booth Besties Facebook group, go join. When you go to search, don't join the page. Facebook won't let us delete it, but it is still there. Look for the group, VO Booth Besties group. And um, you can also catch any of our episodes on our past episodes are all listed on our website and many of them are live on youtube not live um are recorded on youtube where you can watch the video as well popcasts that's what it was that was it podcasts pop up podcasts podcast thank you yeah look for popcasts coming up and feel free to post questions in the group anytime we've got tons of people in there always willing to um, answer questions, give advice, give suggestions. And it, it doesn't even have to be industry. If you have something fun to talk about, add it. We love it. Yeah, We're grateful. It's a community for a reason. Exactly. And that's what keeps the community going is when members engage. So thank you all. And we will catch you in